In this module, we will be discussing how to assess the association between two continuous variables. We will first introduce and discuss correlation, and then later in the module, we'll talk about simple linear regression. Let's return to the blood pressure data used in previous modules to help demonstrate ideas related to correlation. In particular, let's focus on examining the association between systolic and diastolic blood pressure. A linear correlation coefficient can be used to quantify the direction and magnitude of the association between systolic and diastolic blood pressure in this data. There are a total of 149 subjects that have both a systolic and diastolic blood pressure measurement. A single individual is missing both blood pressure measurements. The mean systolic blood pressure is 144.52 and the mean diastolic blood pressure is 75.10. The paired systolic and diastolic blood pressure measurements are shown here for six selected individuals from the data set. A key assumption necessary for the calculation of the correlation coefficient is that each subject must have a value for each of the values being correlated. From a data perspective, these paired values would appear in columns with each individual's paired blood pressure values appearing on the same row. Our interest lies in examining the covariation between these variables. Specifically, we are interested in the linear covariation or linear correlation, which we can examine both graphically and numerically. The most useful graphical summary for examining correlation is the scatter plot diagram, shown here for systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Although this graph has the diastolic blood pressure on the horizontal or x-axis and the systolic blood pressure on the vertical or y-axis, the choice of axes in the context of examining correlation is arbitrary. Each point on the scatter plot diagram has an x value and a y value corresponding to the paired systolic and diastolic blood pressure values for each individual. For example, the circled point here corresponds to the systolic and diastolic blood pressure measurements for one of our six case illustrations, the individual having a systolic blood pressure of 96 and a diastolic blood pressure of 70. Looking at the overall structure of this scanner plot, there is clearly a fair amount of variability among the paired blood pressure values for this sample of data. Still, there does appear to be a pattern of straight line association moving from the lower left to the upper right, suggesting that as systolic blood pressure increases, so does diastolic blood pressure. We can classify patterns of linear correlation as follows. If the data points cluster in a straight line fashion, moving from the upper left to the lower right, this indicates negative linear correlation. This means that the two variables are inversely related. That is, as one variable tends to decrease, the other one tends to increase. If the data points cluster in a straight line fashion moving from the lower left to the upper right, this indicates positive linear correlation. This means that the two variables are directly related. That is, the two variables tend to increase or decrease together. If the data points cluster in a random fashion with no apparent straight line relationship, this indicates zero or no linear correlation. This means that the two variables are not linearly related. We can quantify the linear correlation numerically using a Pearson correlation coefficient. This is a single number taking on values from negative one to positive one that quantifies the direction and magnitude of the linear correlation between two continuous variables. Values of the correlation coefficient close to positive one indicate a strong positive linear correlation between variables. Values of the correlation coefficient close to negative one indicate a strong negative linear correlation between variables. Values of the correlation coefficient close to zero indicate weak or no linear correlation between variables. Our goal is to use a Pearson linear correlation coefficient to quantify the direction and magnitude of the association between systolic and diastolic blood pressure in this data.
In a similar fashion to other tests we have discussed in previous modules, we can perform a hypothesis test at the standard significance level, with the null hypothesis being that the population correlation coefficient, denoted as the Greek letter rho, is equal to zero versus the alternative hypothesis that it is not equal to zero. Most software packages will produce a p-value corresponding to this test. However, it's important to note that for the case of examining linear correlation coefficients, this hypothesis test is usually not meaningful because this is generally not the hypothesis of interest. For the blood pressure example, based on intuition and the scatter plot diagram shown, we already know that systolic and diastolic blood pressure are positively correlated. The question of interest really isn't whether the population correlation is zero, but rather how large the correlation coefficient is and what is the range of plausible values given by the 95% confidence interval. Interestingly, correlation coefficients are commonly reported in the literature in combination with p-values for this non-meaningful hypothesis and without 95% confidence intervals. The estimate of the Pearson correlation between systolic and diastolic blood pressure for this sample of 149 patients is 0.45 with a p-value less than 0.0001 and a 95% confidence interval from 0.31 to 0.57. Like many statistical packages, StatCrunch produces the traditional p-value testing the standard null hypothesis but does not produce a 95% confidence interval. The confidence interval given here was calculated using a website at Vassar which will be dis demonstrated in the StatCrunch demo portion of the module. The assumptions associated with the calculation of the Pearson correlation coefficient and its associated p-value and confidence interval fall into two general categories. The first is related to characteristics of the sample being analyzed. Samples are randomly selected or at least representative of the population of interest. Each subject must have both X and Y values. All subjects were randomly sampled from a single population of interest. Although the X and Y values are paired within individuals, the subjects themselves should be independent from one another. The remaining assumptions are related to the characteristics of the X and Y variables being correlated. The correlation calculations assume that the X values were not used to compute the Y values. That is, the X values cannot be part of the calculation of the Y values, as would be the case for weight and BMI, for example. The X values should be naturally occurring. If the X values are experimentally controlled and there is interest in understanding how changes in X affect the Y values, then simple linear regression, which we will discuss later in the module, would be more appropriate. Both the X and Y values must be sampled from a population following at least approximately a Gaussian distribution. The correlation coefficient assumes that the covariation between the X and Y values is linear. Of course, the covariation between two continuous variables in general could assume a variety of shapes, but the Pearson correlation only measures linear association. Calculation of the correlation coefficient assumes there are no serious outliers in the data. Unfortunately, a single substantial outline point can dramatically influence the Pearson correlation coefficient. Outliers are not necessarily bad points. In fact, they may be the most interesting or important points in the data set. However, if there is interest in examining linear correlation in the presence of outliers, it is more appropriate to use a non-parametric linear correlation coefficient, which happens to be the next topic of interest. Let's talk about the Spearman rank correlation coefficient. Similar to other non-parametric proce procedures we have discussed previously, the Spearman rank correlation coefficient is appropriate to use when the Gaussian assumption is violated. The Spearman correlation coefficient does not depend on any specific distribution. It also ranges from negative 1 to positive 1 like the Pearson correlation coefficient, 
In a similar fashion to the other non-parametric procedures we have discussed, Spearman uses the ranks of the values instead of the actual values. It can then be calculated using the same formula for Pearson's correlation coefficient applied to these ranks. To give you an idea of the differential sensitivity of Pearson and Spearman to the presence of outline points, here is a scatter plot diagram showing a strong positive linear correlation for the majority of the points in the data set, with the exception of a small cluster of substantial outliers. The Pearson correlation coefficient is estimated to be negative 0.06 with a p-value equal to 0.57, indicating its attempt to fit the outliers. If one failed to examine the scatter plot diagram, they would mistakenly conclude that there is no linear correlation between these two variables, and that in fact it is slightly negative. However, the Spearman correlation coefficient correctly ignores the cluster of outliers and captures the positive correlation which is true for the majority of the data points. For the BP data, both the Pearson correlation coefficient and the Spearman rank correlation coefficient are estimated to be 0.45. Examining this scatter plot diagram, we do not see any evidence of strong outliers. It's generally the case that when the data is well behaved, both the Pearson and Spearman correlations will be fairly consistent, as in this example. As pointed out by the quote at the beginning of the chapter on correlation in the Motulski text, the most serious and common error in interpreting correlation is that it implies a causal relationship between the variables being correlated. This is not the case, and correlation does not say anything about causation. There is no distinction between dependent and independent variables in the context of correlation. Causation requires a designed experiment where the levels of the cause variable are changed and all other variables in the experiment are controlled so that changes in the response or dependent variable can be attributed to the changes in the cause variable. Suppose that X and Y are correlated. Let's examine the possible explanations for the observed correlation between these variables. Scenario 1, X causes Y. Scenario 2, y causes x. Scenario 3, x and y are both under the control of another variable z. Scenario 4, x and y and z are part of a complicated set of interrelationships. In scenario 5, x and y don't correlate in the population at all and the observed correlation is totally spurious. The key point to realize is that simple examination of the correlation between X and Y cannot provide the information necessary to distinguish between these five scenarios. In many cases, people consider only the first two scenarios and disregard the possibility of the remaining three. In general, establishing definitive causal relationships is extremely difficult. Let's summarize the steps for calculating a correlation coefficient. 1. Create a scatter diagram. 2. If you can't see it, don't do it. What I mean by this is that if visual examination of the scatter plot diagram isn't consistent with the estimated correlation coefficient, you should proceed with great caution and be skeptical of the results. 3. Remember to produce appropriate descriptive statistics and side-by-side -side box plots in order to assess the Gaussian distribution assumption for the population. 4. When summarizing correlation results, remember to include the correlation coefficient, the sample size of the data set under study, the 95% confidence interval for the correlation coefficient, and potentially a scatter plot diagram of the data. And five, as always, remember to provide an interpretation of the results from a clinical perspective. That's all for now.